of course, when we work with real line, we have a concept of a measure. So on the real line, there is a measure called the Lebesgue measure on the real line. And, um, and uh, that's related to, well, let's say Newton and Euler, the idea how they figured out how on the real line you might still measure things and work with um, infinitesimals. And uh, yes, that's what we call the Lebesgue measure. It's sometimes denoted by lambda, big lambda. This is a measure on the real line and the sigma algebra is not, now it's not the power set and that's actually related to the previous thing. So we are not working on the power set, we are working on the Borel sigma algebra. And we remember this was the sigma algebra generated by the open sets of the real line. And this sigma algebra contains the open sets, but then we know that the closed sets are complements of the open set. So then the sigma algebra also contains all closed sets. It contains unions of closed sets, unions of open, intersections of open and closed and so on. So it's a good and big sigma algebra where we can work. And uh, <clears throat> what in the sense of Lebesgue measure, what we want to do, we want to assign a measure so that the measure of an interval should be the length of the interval. And uh, that's what the idea is. And we ask, okay, this is actually what we want. This is our wish. So when I go shopping from home, somebody gives me a shopping list, that's the wish list, what, what needs to be the outcome. So this is now, now our shopping list. Go on, go shopping, find a measure with this property or come back and say that it doesn't exist if the, if the shop did, didn't have anything. So what about shop of measure theory? Does that shop contain a measure which is well-defined on the Borel sigma algebra of the real line, which satisfies this property? The answer is yes. So there exists one and actually luckily and only one such measure on the set the real numbers and uh, sigma algebra being the Borel sigma algebra. So how to prove this existence? It's not the simple, it's actually rather demanding thing. And that's the topic of the course. Um, this is the topic of the course measure and integral. So if you want to learn more about this, so you should maybe take this course measure and integral. But um, during uh, the probability theory course, we don't um, have time to prove the existence of this uh, measure. Okay. We might have time to prove the uniqueness later on, but not the existence. That's a bit complicated thing. It requires, a, yeah, well, it requires work. Actually, who, who did this work for us? If I recall right, the guy who did this work was uh, Andre Lebesgue. So, France has, uh, besides theory Andre, there's another important Andre, Andre Lebesgue, who uh, actually I think it was PhD thesis uh, where he proved this existence. Um, so it's Lebesgue's PhD thesis where you can read uh, the, the original proof that. Uh, this thing exists that we want to have. Okay, so, and um, what do we know about this measure? Well, because the measure of interval AB is the length of the interval AB. When we increase the interval, so we could ask, for example, what is then the Lebesgue measure of the full real line? So, we can ask this and we could think, okay, 
we know that uh, because it is a measure, so it's countably additive. So we know that um, we can represent the full real line by unions. Like um, we take the set from zero to one, this interval. Then we take the interval from um, one to two. We take the interval from uh, two to three and so on. Then we also take the negative intervals. So we take um, minus one to zero, minus two to minus one and so on. So we have uh, the real line split as a union of a dis it's a disjoint union and it contains every real number. And uh, because this is a measure, so we can say that this disjoint union is actually the sum of these things. So we can sum over all the integers k and then the Lebesgue measure of the corresponding interval here. But now the length of the interval zero to one is one. So we are summing actually what number one. And that's why we see that uh, uh, Lebesgue measure has total mass infinite. Quite natural thing, but now we know how to prove it. Assuming that we know that this thing exists, so just the knowledge that we know that it is a measure, then we can prove that, okay, its total mass is one. So you see that this way we can work with Lebesgue measures, uh, even though we didn't prove that they exist. Uh, what else about the Lebesgue measure? Let's say we, what we did with the uniform uh, discrete um, counting measure, we normalize it to be total mass one. So here we can actually do the same. So um, we can define, um, okay, let's see, do we have time for this now? Maybe we do. So let's fix some, um, okay. Yes, we can define um, a normalized lambda or Let's call it actually, let's call it actually um, P unif as well as, as previously. So we can define P unif um, and then unif on, not on the full real line, because again, we don't have a uniform probability distribution on the full real line, not in the uncountable sense either, but we can fix some, um, let's say the unit interval here, zero, one. And then we can say that, okay, what's the measure of a set here? And we can define it as the, the Lebesgue measure of the set A. Let's actually replace this by some other interval. So let's take any, let's put I here to mean any um, bounded interval. So uniform distribution on any bounded interval I, and then we, define this measure as lambda of A divided by the lambda of I. For any um, Borel set A, uh, which is a subset of I. So in this way, uh, we get a uniform probability distribution. We get the measure with total mass one because we normalized this uh, mass to be one. Uh, and that is the uniform distribution on a continuum interval I. Do you have questions about uh, the Lebesgue measure? Maybe you do because it's a, it could be a new thing. Okay. I see, I'm watching the clock and I see it's soon time for a little break. Let's see before the break, should we look? Yes, before the break, let's do a couple of more examples. Namely, very quickly. We can also define a Lebesgue measure, uh, the so-called D-dimensional Lebesgue measure, and that's called the lambda D. So it's a measure on the D-dimensional Euclidean space and then the Borel sets of the D-dimensional Euclidean, Euclidean space. So again, now the D-dimensional Euclidean space, we, can, we know what the open sets are there. So the open um, unions of open balls 
and uh, then the Borel sigma algebra on the d dimensional space is again it's the smallest sigma algebra that contains the open sets so it's the sigma algebra generated by the open sets of the d dimensional euclidean space now so that's what we call the d dimensional lebesgue measure and uh, how do we define it again our definition is to do a wish list so now our shopping list is here so what we wish is um, a measure on the d-dimensional space which is actually assigning to every box this is a box with a kind of uh, height width and uh, depth so if you go to ikea you know that there are these three measures that you need to know to, to uh, know how big box you have and uh, on the right, this is the this is the volume of the box. So um, that's how things go. And um, and uh, we can, if we are not in dimension three, we can also define the volume of a box in higher dimension using the same formula. And we want a measure, which to every box says that the measure is actually the volume of the box. So that's our wish. Does such a measure exist? Again, the answer is yes. So the wish again is OK. Such a measure does exist. And again, we skip the proof of the existence. Then the final examples. OK, Kalle was kind enough to draw us a box in three dimensions. Um, the final examples that I want to mention before the break are a truncation of measures. Actually, I was hinting at it all, already. Think about um, some measure on some space, uh, some set S and some sigma algebra. Fix some B. So now B is actually some reference. Uh, think about B is a reference set. So B is a reference set where we want to work. We don't want to work on the full set S, but we want to work on a set B. Okay. Then, when we have fixed this B, we want to define a function which maps a set to uh, the measure of A intersection B. And uh, the claim is that this always, also and always, gives you a measure on the set S. S. And uh, when we know this, this is actually quite easy to prove. That is, that is why it's an it's a exercise. And um, then there's another thing. Uh, if we start with the probability measure, and we again, we could fix a reference set B. And we want, of course, B to be such that uh, it has a non-zero mass to make it interesting. So then we can do the same intersection. We can define a map which says that it maps set A to the measure of A intersection B. But now we normalize it by the reference um, measure so that we normalize it this to be total mass 1. This produces as a probability measure. And we use the notation, the conditional probability. So so this is actually a conditional um, uh, probability uh, that we uh, defined in this form. And to prove that this is really a measure, it's an exercise. It's it's easy to do. And this conditioning, this kind of normalization and, and truncation, that's actually if we start now with the Lebesgue measure. So if we start with lambda being the Lebesgue measure, so then we can say that we truncate the Lebesgue measure to the unit interval. So that's the way to get um, uniform probability distribution on the uncountable continuum uh, unit interval, 0, 1. 